Hello, I'm Sheldon Axler, the author of Linear Algebra Done Right. This video discusses part two of the section of the book titled Polar Decomposition and Singular Value Decomposition. In this video, we will be focusing on the singular value decomposition. Suppose T is an operator on V. The singular values of T are defined to be the eigenvalues of the square root of T star T with each eigenvalue lambda listed as many times as the dimension of the null space of the square root of t star t minus lambda times the identity. Recall that that null space being non-zero is precisely the condition for lambda being an eigenvalue, so that dimension is always greater than or equal to 1. Recall that the square root of t star t is a positive operator. That means that all its eigenvalues are non-negative numbers. Thus, the singular values are, by definition, non-negative numbers. Let's also note that each operator on V has as many singular values as the dimension of V. There are many ways to see this. For example, from the spectral theorem applied to the square root of t star t, we can easily see that the sum of the dimensions of the null spaces of the square root of t star t minus lambda times the identity is equal to the dimension as we take the sum over all the eigenvalues. Examples always help to understand what's going on, so let's look at an example. Define t to be the operator on f4 shown here. We're thinking of f4 as the inner product space with the standard inner product. The calculation shows that t star t is the operator shown here. You actually should stop the video and do this calculation. You can do the calculation either using the definition of t star or using matrices. Write out the matrix of t, then its conjugate transpose, and do the matrix multiplication. Notice that t star t, with respect to the standard basis of f4, has a diagonal matrix with respect to that standard basis. And the entries on the diagonal are 9, 4, 0, and 9. Thus, in this case, we can easily calculate the square root of t star t. It's the operator shown here. As we see, the square root of t star t is also a diagonal matrix with respect to the standard basis, with 3, 2, 0, 3 along the diagonal. Thus, we easily see that the eigenvalues of the square root of t star t are 3, 2, and 0, and the dimension of the null spaces as are shown here. This means that the singular values of t are 3, 3, 2, and 0. Notice that we have four singular values, and that's because we're working on a four-dimensional vector space. By the way, the eigenvalues of this operator t are negative 3 and 0. Thus, perhaps it's not surprising that the numbers 3 and 0 appear in the list of singular values. But notice that the number 2 appears in the list of singular values, but it does not appear among the eigenvalues. 2, however, does appear in the definition of t. Thus, sometimes singular values pick up more information than the eigenvalues do. Now we're ready to state the singular value decomposition. This is one of the big, important theorems of linear algebra, so it gets some Beethoven victory music. Suppose T is an operator on V with singular values S1 up to Sn. The singular value decomposition states that there exists orthonormal bases E1 up to En and F1 up to Fn such that t of v has a beautiful, simple form shown here. Note that here we have two orthonormal bases, e1 up to en and f1 up to fn. We cannot necessarily take these bases to be the same. In the equation that's now in red in the statement of the singular value decomposition, let v equal ej. Then, because E1 up through En is an orthonormal basis, we see that T of Ej is equal to S sub J times F sub J. 
That implies that the matrix of T with respect to the bases E1 up to En and then F1 up to Fn is the diagonal matrix with the singular values along the diagonal. This is one of the rare cases when we use two different bases to find the matrix even though we are looking at a linear map from a vector space to itself. Use appropriate caution when dealing with this. For example, if one wants to find the matrix of t squared, that cannot be found by squaring the matrix because of the use of different bases. Now let's erase this material about the matrix of t so that we have room to present the proof of the singular value decomposition. Amazingly, we can fit the entire proof on just this one slide. We will be using the spectral theorem applied to the square root of t star t. Recall that the square root of t star t is a positive operator. In particular, it is self-adjoint. Thus, we can apply the spectral theorem regardless of whether our scalar field is real or complex. The spectral theorem applied to the square root of t star t tells us that there's an orthonormal basis, E1 up to En of V, consisting of eigenvectors for the square root of t star t. And of course, the associated eigenvalues are precisely the singular values, because that's how the singular values are defined. Now, every vector v can be expressed as a linear combination of v1 up to en, and because e1 up to en is an orthonormal basis, we have the formula now displayed. Apply the square root of t star t to both sides of the equation that's now in red in the left column, getting the equation shown in the right column now. Just using linearity, we get this. By the polar decomposition, there's an isometry s on v, such that t is equal to s times the square root of t star t. Apply s to both sides of the equation above, the one that's now in red, getting the following equation that's now shown below in red. For each j, let f sub j equal s applied to e sub j. S is an isometry, so S maps an orthonormal basis onto an orthonormal basis. In other words, F1 up through Fn is an orthonormal basis of V. The equation above, now in red, now becomes the equation that we wanted as the conclusion for the singular value decomposition. This completes the proof of the singular value decomposition. Suppose T is an operator on V then the singular values of t are defined to be the eigenvalues of the square root of t star t, with each eigenvalue repeated as many times as the dimension of the null space of the square root of t star t minus lambda i. Thus, finding the singular values of t just from the definition requires one to find the operator the square root of t star t. Finding the positive square root of a positive operator can be a non-trivial task. Thus, our next result can sometimes make things simpler. This result says that the singular values of t are the non-negative square roots of the eigenvalues of t star t minus lambda i. In other words, if we use this result, we do not need to compute the square root of t star t. Please read the proof of this result in the book. Let's look at an example that illustrates the use of this result. To find t to be the operator on F4, shown here, where F4 has the standard inner product. Notice that this is the same example we computed earlier, directly from the definition. As we saw then, we get the formula shown here for the operator t star t. But now we don't need to find its square root because of this result. If we look at that operator, we see that with respect to the standard orthonormal basis of F4, it's a diagonal matrix with entries 9, 4, 0, and 9 along the diagonal. Thus, the eigenvalues of T star T are 9, 4, and 0, with the dimensions of the corresponding null spaces shown here. We now take the square roots of those numbers, according to the theorem to the left, and realize that the singular values of t 
are 3, 3, 2, and 0. Same result we obtained before, but without going through the process of finding the square root of t star t. The exercises in this section of the book contain many interesting results about the singular value decomposition. I'm going to list some of those exercises now. You'll learn a little bit just from reading these exercises, but you will learn a lot more if you pause the video and actually try to work out these exercises for yourself. Here's the first exercise. Suppose t is a self-adjoint operator on v. Prove that the singular values of t equal the absolute values of the eigenvalues of t, repeated appropriately. Please be careful, this result is not necessarily true for non-self-adjoint operators. Here's the next exercise. Suppose t is an operator on v. Prove that t and the adjoint of t have the same singular values. Third exercise. Suppose t is an operator on v. Prove that t is invertible if and only if 0 is not a singular value of t. Of course, that should remind you of the statement that t is invertible if and only if 0 is not an eigenvalue of t. Our fourth exercise states the following. Suppose t is an operator on v. Prove that the dimension of the range of t equals the number of non-zero singular values of t. This result illustrates an important application of the singular value decomposition. Suppose you have an operator t and you know its matrix with respect to some orthonormal basis. You want to find the dimension of the range of t. You can do that using Gaussian elimination. That works fine if your matrix consists of exact data. But suppose your matrix of t consists of data that you've observed and there are small measurement errors in that data. Then Gaussian elimination is not a good way to find the dimension of the range. The reason for this is that the Gaussian elimination process depends upon deciding whether some entries are zero and making decisions based upon that. Suppose one of your entries is 10 to the minus fifth. That really might be zero. In other words, it really could be just an error in measurement. You might end up dividing by that in Gaussian elimination, introducing huge errors. Thus, the best way to find the dimension of the range is to find the singular values of t, and then see if some of them look out of scale with the others. For example, suppose you're working on a 10-dimensional ten, ten vector space, so you have a 10 by 10 matrix. You find the singular values of t, and let's suppose eight of them are between 1 and 5, and the other two are 10 to the minus 10th power. It's a good guess that those two that are 10 to the minus 10th are errors, and they really should be 0. So you might want to guess that the dimension of the range of t, if the data were measured accurately, is 8. Also, if you find the singular value decomposition of t, you might want to throw away terms corresponding to very small singular values. These are quite possibly errors. Another possibility is you need to transmit a large matrix and you need to do some compression. Again, doing the singular value decomposition then allows you to throw away the least important things when you do the compression. This has lots of practical applications. The next exercise asks you to prove that an operator is an isometry if and only if all of its singular values equal 1. This is a very pretty result. Here's another exercise. Suppose t is an operator on v. Let s hat denote the smallest singular value of t, and let s denote the largest singular value of t. Part a is to prove the inequality shown here. And part b is to prove that if lambda is an eigenvalue of t, then the absolute value of lambda lies between the smallest singular value of t and the largest singular value of t. You should pause the video and spend lots of time working on these exercises, because we're now going to erase them to show you some more exercises. Suppose t has a singular value decomposition given by the equation shown here, where s1 up through sn are the singular values of t, and e1 up through en are orthonormal bases of v. 
Our first exercise now is to prove that if v is a vector in v, then we have the following formula for the adjoint of t applied to v. Notice that in this formula, we are just interchanging the e's and the f's. It's a nice way to think about the adjoint. The next exercise gives a formula for t star t applied to v. Notice that this involves just the e's and not the f's, and also that it involves the squares of the singular values. The next exercise gives a formula for the square root of t star t applied to v. Notice that this also involves just the e's. And finally, suppose t is invertible. Prove that we have the formula shown here for the inverse of t. This involves both e1 through en and f1 through fn, and notice that the singular values are now in the denominator. That's OK, because we discussed earlier uh, an operator t is invertible if and only if all the singular values are non-zero. You will learn a lot if you spend time working on these exercises. This concludes part two of the video on polar decomposition and singular value decomposition. If you see a small picture of a slide in the upper left corner of this slide, then you can click on it to get to the next video. If you see a small picture of part of the cover of linear algebra done right in the upper right corner of this slide, then you can click on it to get to the book's website.